Congenital Femoral Deficiency for Parents, Part 3 of 3, Paley Types 2, 3, and 4. This is being recorded by the world's most experienced CFD, PFFD surgeon. I am Dr. Dror Paley. By now, hopefully, you've reviewed Parts 1 and Parts 2 of the Congenital Femoral Deficiency for Parents. I'm the director of the Paley Institute. You can access us through paleyinstitute.org. We've previously discussed the Paley classification for congenital femoral deficiency. Part one dealt with lengthening of types 1A. Part two with reconstruction of the hip and knee for types 1B. And this lecture will discuss types two, three, and four, which are less common but much more severe types of congenital femoral deficiency. Type two involves a pseudarthrosis or false joint or lack of connection between a femoral head that's in the joint and the shaft of the femur which has a greater trochanter present but is not connected to the femoral head or neck. This this pseudarthrosis creates a problem in terms of the integrity of the hip joint, and the hip joint is unstable because the femur can piston up and down. I developed a procedure called the Super Hip 2. This procedure uses a similar incision and approach to the Super Hip 1, but is a much more complicated operation. In the Super Hip 2, we use the upper part of the femur to turn it into a femoral neck. We make a special bone cut of the upper femur after first removing the gluteus, medius, and minimus muscles. We turn the piece of bone at the upper femur and rotate it so that it connects to the femoral head. We keep that piece of bone alive by connection to adjacent muscles. Once that piece has rotated 135 degrees, it is connected to the femoral head by special pins that have a screw-like attachment to them. These wires, or threaded pins, connect the new femoral neck to the femoral head. We now attach the femoral neck to the rest of the shaft of the femur using what is called a rush rod, and we add a tension band wire around that. This stabilizes the upper femur. The upper femur now has a normal alignment and anatomy. We reconnect the muscle into place by suturing it to the greater trochanter. Now all the muscles have been reconstructed and the anatomy of the bone has been reconstructed. To stabilize this during the healing period, we apply an external fixator from the pelvis to the femur to the tibia in order to protect it from any motion. A cast is insufficient to stabilize this and that's why an external fixator is required. One advantage, however, is that the patient is able to walk and put weight on the leg during this treatment because the external fixator is so strong. Let me show you an example. Here is a Paley type 2 in, a, um, in an infant. We performed an MRI to establish that there is no connection between the femoral head and the shaft of the femur. We then at the age of three, performed the super hip two procedure. There was also a knee flexion contracture and this was released and we did a super knee procedure. We applied the external fixer to the pelvis. We also applied a wire across the knee to keep the knee straight after straightening it. After all the hardware was removed, you can see the child one year post-op. She has a newly reconstructed hip and knee that function extremely well. Then we did the first lengthening at age six. We stabilized fixation from the pelvis to the femur to the tibia to protect the new hip joint. The lengthening went uneventfully and we achieved a total of about six centimeters of lengthening. We put a rod in to protect the femur at the time of removal. After the first lengthening, you can see her appearance. She's a happy child and she has excellent range of motion of her knee and her hip Look how much hip mobility she has in flexion, in abduction, and even in hip rotation. It's like a normal hip joint. 
After the first lengthening, we also perform the growth stoppage at age 10. This is to decrease the total leg length discrepancy that she would have. We then proceeded with the second lengthening uh, not long after that. During the second lengthening, we achieved a total of eight centimeters of length. She tolerated the procedure well, and at the end, again, we put a rod down the femur. She will have to have one or two more lengthenings to complete the equalization. Another example is a type 2B. In a type 2B, the, either the femoral head is absent or it is fused to the acetabulum. Therefore, there's no hope for recreating a normal hip joint by connecting the head to the shaft. In this case, we use a pseudo hip created by what's called a pelvic support osteotomy. We bend the femur at the angle that's shown, and this gives support kind of like your hand sitting under your chin supporting your head, where the head is the pelvis and the hand is the femur with the bent angle. This pelvic support osteotomy is really a femur osteotomy. We really don't touch the pelvis. And the femur itself doesn't contact the pelvis because there are muscles and soft tissues uh, interposing between them. We managed to achieve a record amount of 13 centimeters of lengthening during this treatment. We left her alone for a few years. She, re she regained all her hip and her knee motion. And then at the age of 15, we redid the pelvic support osteotomy because it had straightened out on its own and we did another lengthening. This was done after she'd finished growing, so the pelvic support osteotomy will not straighten out again. This remodeling is only seen in young children. At the age of 15, with the pelvic support osteotomy and after the second lengthening, she has finally equal leg length. You can see the before on the left, during on the middle, and after on the right side. After two lengthenings and hip reconstruction, at the age of 15, she has no leg length discrepancy. She's had a total of 23 centimeters of lengthening. You can see the x-ray before at age 9 when we started and after at age 15 when we were finished. Here she is 25 years later. This girl came to us all the way from Australia. Her function is normal. She's now um, a student attending university. The type 3 is the most severe of the congenital femoral deficiencies. In this type, there is a complete absence of the hip joint and even of the bone of the upper femur. There is no greater trochanter. Many of the muscles are disorganized or missing. There are several ways of treating type 3, but if there is good knee motion, one can consider reconstructing the leg. In this type, we essentially are going to convert it to a type 2B. We convert it by lengthening it and at a later time doing the pelvic support osteotomy. The first lengthening here was done at age 7 with a 5-inch lengthening or 12 and a half centimeters. The second lengthening was done after she'd recovered fully from the first lengthening. As you can see, she walks around with an, a small brace on her ankle and a shoe lift. Here's the second lengthening a few years later, and we achieved another five inches of lengthening during the second lengthening. Third lengthening was performed together with the pelvic support hip reconstruction. We did a total of four inches this time, only lengthening the femur, while the previous lengthenings also had some lengthening in the tibia. Here's the device that was used, which is connected to the pelvis, the femur, and the tibia, and allows the hip and knee to bend while we lengthen the femur. This is before the third lengthening with the femur completely straight, and you can see after the pelvic support uh, combined with the third lengthening on the right. This is her mobility. After the third lengthening, she still has excellent knee mobility and ankle mobility and excellent function in walking. We ended up having to do one small correction at the ankle with another inch of lengthening at the lower tibia. In total, we did 
50 centimeters of lengthening. Uh, in other words, 20 inches. This is the record in my career for total amount of lengthening. Once she reached skeletal maturity, you can see here at the age of 20, she's equal leg length, has a pelvic support osteotomy, has good mobility of the hip and knee and ankle, and, and has ended up with an excellent result. Type 3B is a similar situation with a large part of the femur missing, but this time the knee joint is, is very stiff and, cannot, the, and the motion of the knee cannot be regained. In the type 3B, it is probably not a good idea to attempt lengthening reconstruction surgery. We aim for the most functional treatment possible. We really should consider what is called a rotation plasty. There are different types of rotation plasty, and my preference is the brown rotation plasty. I modified the brown rotation plasty by fusing the femur to the pelvis with a special osteotomy called the Chiari osteotomy. I therefore refer to it as the Paley modification of the brown rotation plasty. In this operation, we rotate the leg around nearly 180 degrees. We make an incision and expose all the muscles of the thigh. The muscles are disconnected from the knee joint. The, the nerve and artery of the leg are preserved, and then the leg is rotated around. Before the muscles are reconnected, we cut the pelvic bone in such a way and slide it over that the femur can slot into place. The knee is converted into a hip joint, and the knee, the femur is fused to the pelvis so that the knee can now function as a hip joint. We reconnect the muscles that will now operate the new hip joint. The nerves are free. There's no damage to the surrounding structures. The ankle turns into a knee joint. Notice that before surgery, his foot and ankle are at the level of the opposite knee. That is the ideal candidate for a rotation plasty. He has fibular hemimelia as well as congenital femoral deficiency. We rotated his limb around at the age of two with the paley modified brown rotation plasty. After achieving this reconstruction, you can see the appearance of his leg two years post-op and as well the x-ray inside his prosthesis. This is the movement of his ankle which will now function as a knee joint. His knee is going to function as a hip joint. Notice how he can actively, on his own, straighten and bend his knee joint by activating his ankle. The ankle is the part that is motoring the prosthesis. This is without the prosthesis at three-year follow-up, and you can see here at four-year follow-up, uh, he stands with his ankle still at the level of the opposite knee. Here's a five-year follow-up, and here he is with excellent active function of the knee joint. He has excellent function also of his hip joint, which is really the original knee joint. He performs karate and plays football. He's very sports active. Type four is a very rare deficiency where the deficiency is at the knee and not the hip. There's a severe deformity at the knee, but the hip is re relatively normal. It took me a while to figure out how to reconstruct these, and in about 10 years ago, I came up with this reconstruction for the type 4 cases. This involves moving the fibula around, creating a, a type of socket for this very dysplastic knee joint, and then realigning it. We create a hinge using two washers and a special suture to go through the center of rotation. This is a boy who's gone through this process and then underwent the lengthening. Here he is with his shoe lift. He's got good range of motion of his hip and knee, and he's ended up with an excellent result. In conclusion, each congenital femoral deficient type has its own treatment. This is based on the paleo classification, which determines the type of treatment follow a reconstructive life plan that is determined at the original consultation. Only specialized centers are best equipped to treat CFD. If you want to reach us, you can contact us at the number below and at paleoinstitute.org. Thank you for watching. If you have any questions, please connect to us through our email 
or website. Thank you. Thank you. Please stand by.